G'day and welcome back for more Space Engineer Survival. And today we're going to update our map. The one that we've been using since the start is this little one here. And it's one I made because my initial vision for this cabin, at least before I started making extensions to it, was to think of it like a little hunting lodge or something along those lines where you've got a little cabin in the woods, nicely nestled away in this pretty little valley where as the sun rises you get an amazing view. And I thought it would be sensible to have a map showing you the approximate areas around your base. And this map I created using a single screenshot that I took with the spectator camera. And if we hop into the spectator camera, I can show you exactly how I did that. Let's zoom around to one of the light areas of the planet and use this lake as an example. So I went up to an altitude like this, took a single screenshot, and then I took that into Photoshop, edited it down, made it a little bit clearer, a bit more contrast between the different levels of the terrain, and I put the little red dot in it to show where the base was. Then I had to convert it into a square, and then I used SE image to LCD to bring it into the game as this. If we go into edit text, you'll see all of this funny stuff, which is all just a monospace font, which allows us to display these pixels in their colors that we want them to show. Now, that's all well and good for a single image, but if we're going to go for a big wall sized one, and we want to show a bit more of the local area, we're going to need to do things a bit differently. And if we hop back to our spectator camera, you can see a problem that we're going to run into with that, which is if we just zoom out further, we're eventually going to end up with something like this, which could look pretty and might look a bit interesting a way to display the map, but it won't really look like a map. And I want something that looks like what we think of as a map, which is a flattened version of the surrounding area. So what we can do is stitch together a bunch of images. And if we start stitching them together, we're going to want to move on a nice straight line around in each direction so that we eventually cover a larger area. We want to stay at the same altitude. So we want to stop doing what I was doing, which was moving a little bit. But then as we get further off to the side, we're going to run into the same problem with the perspective changing because we're moving perfectly in a straight line according to the absolutes of the Space Engineers universe. That's not really going to work. What we really want if we're going to get a good map is something that pretend that follows an imaginary arc that is basically like the atmosphere here that stays exactly the same height above sea level of the planet. And we also want the camera line or the shot to be taken directly facing downwards so that it's perpendicular to that imaginary sea level surface the whole time. That means that anything that's more elevated will get closer to us. Anything deeper will be further away. And that's fine because we'll be able to see everything nice and neatly. The final thing we also need is light. So we need it to be taken around midday. If we were at the poles, that becomes difficult because you end up with a situation like this, where because of the direction of light, we can see this side, but we cannot see anything over this way, which doesn't make the most useful map. Fortunately, we're relatively near the equator, so we can get a fairly reliable map just moving around easily. So, how are we going to deal with all of those problems? Well, thankfully, Rich27 has solved one of them for me. And that is with a little script that will align a camera to gravity if you build it on a bunch of rotors. So that's what we're going to do. We're first going to set up our camera. And our camera is going to be built onto... I guess we'll use the Ugly Duckling since right now... It's got a fully charged battery. We can use it to take a few shots to build this map. 
So, we need a couple of things to be able to add this onto the Ugly Duckling. We need a rotor. We need a remote control. And we need a camera. So the way we'll need to align this is first off having a rotor like this. Then what we'll add next is a little slope like, let's use this one like that. Then onto that we place our remote control. I don't think it matters which way we orient this at all. I think it figures it out anyway. Then next onto this we can add another... Oh, I added that in the wrong spot. Get rid of that. We actually want the remote control on there. There we go. That's better. Next we add another rotor to allow movement in the other direction. Which will be that way. Then finally, so that the camera can remain aligned to what we're going to imagine as north, south, east or west, which will make it much easier for us to line the images up later, we need a, another rotor going like that. And on the end of that rotor, we're going to place a camera directly onto it. If I can get into position to do so. There we go. Camera on there. So we'll weld those up and then we will also need, before we weld that up, a programmable block so that we can add a script to our ship here. We're actually going to add two programmable blocks because while this script allows us to get a camera pointing directly down towards in the line of gravity, which will be perfectly perpendicular to the sea level, we need to know that we're going to be at the same height above sea level. So we need a second programmable block to run M Master's automatic LCD script. And with that script, we will be able to have on an LCD a display saying what height we are above sea level. And these additions to the Ugly Duckling are going to be temporary since I kind of liked the little shape that it had before, but I don't really have enough battery to build a specific craft for this. So I'm just going to add a massive LCD on the back here so that when we display our sea level, we can actually see it from our third person point of view. So I'll weld those up and then we'll get to setting up those scripts. Okay, now that that's all welded up, we can start setting things in motion. So if we move our camera around here so that we can see what's happening with that rotor, then we go to our programmable block. Let's rename this one to be PB Gravity. Oh, that is not how you spell gravity. Aligned camera. Then we go edit, browse workshop. When it loads, there we go. We want GAC, which is Rich 27's Gravity Aligned Camera Script. And the link for this, as well as any of the other scripts that I'm using, will be at the top of the description of the video. So we click OK, pretty simple explanation of what it does, check code, OK, remember and exit. And as you see, immediately that camera has aligned itself perfectly to gravity in the local area, which is less surprising than what is happening with the seat that I am sitting on, as it is visible through objects. That is very strange. It's very, very handy that this script does this, but I'm still weirded out by what's going on with this seat. What the heck? Okay, that's a weird bug. Anyway, next up, we'll grab our other programmable block, which we'll rename to be PB Sea Level. And we go edit with it, browse workshop, and for this one, we want Automatic LCDs 2, OK. Check code, OK, remember and exit. Now, we need one of our, we need our LCD panel. We need to name it like the script likes, like that. Then in custom data, we want alt 
altitude C. Oh, I don't think that needs to be capitalized. Okay. And there we go. It's showing on the screen, so we can now increase the font size. I think that. Yeah, there we go. So now this is easily visible from a distance, which is very useful. Now, let's grab control. Unlock. And there we go. We can fly! Now, one unfortunate thing about having this many rotors on a build like the Ugly Duckling is that it does slowly drift down towards the ground. And there's actually a relatively easy solution for that if you've got rotors on a ship. And it's using yet another script. Wait, am I now? Oh, that bug's gone away. Yay! So, we can actually use Vector Thrust to fix that problem for us a little bit. It manages to properly counteract the forces that these rotors generate. So, what you can do is if we want to just do a simple, easy fix for this that's temporary, and again, adding more things to the Ugly Duckling, we can just add a single rotor here and it and a single engine, and we'll pretty much have it solved. There we go, and a programmable block again, so that we have something to run the script. This is an awful lot of scripts for one little map, but it's what I found is the easiest way to do this. Okay, now let's set up vector thrust as well. <laughs> and we've got another programmable block somewhere here. This one, let's call this PB vector thrust. Don't really worry about the name too much. Custom data, not custom data. No, stop clicking custom data. Browse workshop. Vector thrust two. Okay. Then, what I would like to change, just to make this a bit easier to run, is set it up so that it runs at the start exactly how I like it, which is thruster mode is on when you start the script. Check code, remember an exit, and now, it's going crazy, but that should fix in a second, I hope. We can then go OK, Control, Control, G, and we want our programmable block. Where is it? This one. And we want run. Confirm. Just run it with normal arguments. Here we go. Now you can see that we hover a whole lot better now that Vector Thrust is helping us keep a particular altitude. So, yes, it won't work so well if I start tilting. I'm still going to drift. But if I get myself relatively level, this should keep me lev uh, steady enough that we can get our accurate camera, our accurate images. So what I think is a reasonable way to get a map using a rig like this is to head up to a fairly high altitude, pretty much as high as you can go. Let's turn that off. No, don't want to turn it off while it's doing stuff. Oh, it's, that's not standby. <laughs> uh, whoopsie. What we want is vector thrust, run with ascent, stand by. Confirm. While I'm going up, I don't want it trying to help me. So we want to get up as high as we can before too much of the cloud starts getting in the way of our photos and before we start getting too much curve visible even within one shot. But we also don't want to be so low that we have to take 50,000 photos since it's not that easy to get these to align to each other. The reason we want the altitude above sea level marker is that the altitude meter you can see on my HUD, it actually measures your height above the ground directly beneath you, not your height above sea level. So it's not going to be a consistent line around the planet. It won't stay at a consistent altitude above sea level. So not so helpful for you. We want to stay at exactly the same level as we go around so that we can get things working properly for this map. And I think we could probably go up to about 4,000 metres above sea level. 
you can see one problem I'm going to have taking photos right now when we look down. The shadows cast from the early morning sun are definitely still an issue because they are blocking out a lot of visibility for us. So we'd want to settle ourselves to pretty much exactly 5,000 meters. One or two meters either side won't be likely to make much of a difference. We can then grab our camera view up into that and this camera is now pointing straight downward once we're in this view we can then press f12 get a screenshot we can press k and i like to for the first one create a gps marker then when we jump out of this view which unfortunately then loses me control of the ship we know we've got our marker there so we can then move round to our left a couple of hundred meters and we can use that GPS marker to know roughly how far we're going to go and we'll take another shot once we reset ourselves to 5,000 meters above sea level and look at that I've actually managed to stay perfectly at 5,000 meters that was unexpected so now again view down get rid of all my hard markers and take another screenshot and we can then get a whole bunch of these photos together obviously the trouble with these photos right now is that I've got the shadow running across the view and so I'm not really going to be able to use these. I'd need to wait until midday to take all these shots. Because I knew that was going to be a problem, I've actually already taken all of the photos I need. I did that loading up the game separately so that I could get them all, get them all aligned and get ready to do all of the setup outside of Space Engineers so that we didn't have to go through it all in the game with our real survival scenario because it's going to take a lot of time. And I also spent quite a bit of time fiddling around with how to set this up and I needed to do that in creative because I was really struggling with what to do to get this to work. And without Ridge 27 script I wasn't able to get too great an image but in the end I managed to collect some good photos thanks to it and some consistent images that I've stitched together in Photoshop once I've landed the ugly duckling back in the hangar we'll pop out of Space Engineers and we'll go into Photoshop and have a look at another little bit of software that will help us set up our map exactly as we want it so in software like Photoshop or GIMP, what you can do is overlay multiple images on one another and line them up so that they look like they're one continuous image. And what I've found with this sort of mapping photo information is that Photoshop's ability to align them with its automate photo merge is pretty limited. It didn't actually work very well at all and I've actually had to manually set it all up. And my end result of that manual setup is this. This is going to be the basis of our map. I stitched this together from a whole bunch of screenshots. You can see on the side here all of those. And this is roughly where our base is. I think, oh no, wait, just there, maybe? If I zoom all the way in, I reckon we can estimate that that is our base. And we know that the enemy base is somewhere up here, so if we zoom in up there... I reckon that's the enemy base just there. So that's our mapping information that we're going to use for creating our special map for our wall. And what we need to do is set this up so it can be used in an LCD in the game using the monospace font. And I'm this time going to use WIP's image converter. Last time I did something like this, I used SE image to LCD, but I've been recommended this one and I thought I'd give it a try. It makes things much simpler. It's straightforward. It's got easy instructions written in the program itself. Whip has some very impressive scripts on the workshop, some of which I would like to try out later in the survival series for setting up a few things, but none just yet. The downside of using Whip's image converter is that it won't divide an image into multiples for you. SE image to LCD did do that. But this one works straight out of the box, you don't have to uncheck anything, so it's kind of nice in that way. It also has these multiple dithering modes that you can use, and 
These are a couple of examples that are included to show what the dithering can do. For a photo like this, the dithering makes a big difference and make it, makes it appear much better. For a photo like this, however, the dithering can make it quite messy. I've found that for this map, having no dithering is probably the best. So, we need to divide this map up into... Well, first we need to bring this down to the right dimensions for our map wall. And I've actually already cropped this to a 2x3, but we also need to bring it down to the right resolution. And the right resolution for this will be 178 times 3 across this way and 178 times 2 down this way. That's because using the monospace font, we have 178 pixels by 178 pixels on each square LCD. And I've already done that. If we go to open recent in this version. So this is our final map that we're going to use. I've located the house symbol over where our base is and this X is where we know the enemy is. I don't know where any other enemies are as yet, but if any turn up on this map, I'll add them later on. In Photoshop, we can divide this image relatively easily using the, what's it called? Slice Select Tool. So if we just delete these ones for the moment, we can then right click, divide slice, divide horizontally by two, and divide vertically by three. And there we go, we have our slices set up. It then becomes quite easy to select one of them. Press Ctrl C for copy, Ctrl N for new, and it'll give us a new image that'll be the exact size of these pixels that we can then save separately. If we go Ctrl V, and then we can save that as a separate image. I've already saved all of these as separate images, so we can click browse. It should take me straight to my survival folder. If we go down here, you'll see I have map 1A, B and C and map 2A, B and C. So those are the two rows. And all we need to do is click open, then convert and copy to clipboard. Now the monospace font that we need to put into that LCD is already in my clipboard. So I can jump back into Space Engineers. Remember that I haven't built those <laughs> LCDs yet. Uh, go to production. Let's add some ugh, add some displays to the production list because I think we've run out. And we can go upstairs and we can build those LCDs ready to import this thing. So we need to build six LCDs across here and we need them all to be oriented the same way. Like so. Once all those displays are built, we can actually weld this up. So let's wait for those and then we'll weld up. And we are done. There we go. We've got our big LCD wall. And the first image we picked up was 1A, which is this top left one here. So we can right click on our LCD panel. We can go to edit text and we can just press Ctrl V for paste. Click OK, show text on screen, change our font down to monospace, bring our font size all the way down and we're done. We have our map. I'm going to set up the other ones on the following LCDs just the same way. But what I might do first is name all of these LCDs something particular. So LCD map wall 1B. So I'll name them all so that I know which ones are which. Now that they're all named, we can search map, grab them all, and we can set up these fonts and font sizes for all of them at once so that we don't have to do it each time so now that that's done we can alt tab back to whips image converter we can browse and we can find the next map which is 1b open convert and copy right click on this map edit text okay just realized i forgot to set one setting with all of these maps show text on screen there we go. Now I'm going to go through the rest of them and do that. 1C. And there we go. We have a giant map. Well, let's turn off my headlights. And I reckon that looks pretty cool. We can see our whole big area around here. We've got our little house symbol, which I think turned out quite nicely. We've got our little X, which didn't work out as 
prettily, but still shows what it needs to show. So we can tell a fair bit about what's around our area, just on this map. But there is one thing that I don't like about it. It's a bit bright. This one's probably a little bit bright as well. I do prefer the green that I managed to achieve with this image versus this one. This one's all a bit brown and muted and ugh. this one's more pretty and bright. So if we grab all our map LCDs, we can actually make them a little less glowy by dropping, let's say this, drop this down to 200 with each one. Where does that look? About the same. Let's go a bit further. So what we're doing by dropping these down is we're kind of dimming the backlight is the way that I think about it. I'm sure there's smarter ways to think about it, but that's how I think about it. So that's how we can get the brightness adjusted using a mono space font image like this. And the nice thing about being able to do that is I feel that it now looks more like it's a painted image or a printed image rather than being on a screen itself even though the lighting is fairly uniform, but it doesn't pop out so much from the surrounding area. And I really like having this big map wall. I think it's kind of cool knowing what the local area looks like. So that was what I wanted to do with those LCDs all along. I really liked the idea of having this map, which I think we will leave here for now, but we will move once we have our quarters. I'd love to keep this image more for a bit of history and I think I will put it in my main quarters somewhere around there so I think it'll be kind of cool to have that I might even oh what I could do is make it like a little screen if we use a rotor and hide it we could make like a desk and put it as a screen on the desk or something like that <sighs> so many ideas that I have to do when we get to designing the living quarters so that was actually all I had planned for this episode today. I didn't think we'd end up doing much else. We're still getting a lot of production done. If we have a look, see how many steel plates we've got lying around. We've got 2,000, another 3,600, another 2,200. So we've got a fair few lying around. But before we go, I'm going to head downstairs because I am very disappointed with how the welder turned out. It really hasn't cut the mustard. Muster? Mustard? I think it's cut the... Hmm. I'm going to have to look up that expression. Cut muster? Met muster? I don't know. There's something about muster or mustard. Uh. Anyway. It hasn't really done what I hoped it would do. Let's get the goose out of the way, because I think we can still make use of it for one thing, which is welding up the blast doors. So let's get the goose out of here so we can get the welding ship in place. And one thing else I should mention, holy moly, the number of awesome names that people came out with when I asked about what I should name this little ship was ridiculous. You guys came up with such an enormous number of names. It was insane. I liked far too many of them and have started writing out the list of them. A couple of them I really want to use not for this ship, but I want to save because I think they'll work perfectly for other ships. And one of the most popular suggestions that I think I will save for that sort of thing is actually going to be the... What was it called? Henry... Oh, the, the Chicken Hawk. Henry. And I would like the Chicken Hawk to actually be something that can do a little bit of fighting. Why am I writing chicken? I want to write steel plate. Same chicken, that's why I was writing chicken. So let's whack another bunch of steel plates in these. Then, what we're going to do is we're just going to weld up this blast door because while I can't use this welding ship to do much on the ground, it is still quite effective for this door. And this brings me to my conundrum. I had a couple of thoughts about how to improve this welding ship while sticking... Oh dear! That's bad. 
Forgot about the thrusters. Just burnt a hole in the floor. Oops. Oopsie. Yeah. This welding ship leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> Oops. Uh, so, I had a couple of thoughts. One was, and I think now that I've seen myself burn a hole in the floor, I think I will go with, which is to make a rover with a welder on the front pointed downward. Since we're going to be doing a lot of welding on the floor and having a rover that can cheaply do that without having to spend all the energy on lifting all of these plates would probably be worth it. Even though we'd have limited use outside of the hangar, it would still probably have enough value to do it that way. The other thing I was thinking about was building a welder with a combination of the vector thrust script by 1WSX10 so that we only need a few large thrusters to keep the thing aloft and it would allow us to turn to almost any angle we needed to without reducing the thrust in any significant way. But to make that more useful than just having a small welder on the front, we would also use rotors to convert a small rotor or small advanced rotor to a large grid rotor so that we can then have our enormous and still thankfully effective large grid welder for doing all of the walls and other little bits and pieces that we can fit however big that ship turns out to be inside. So I think we may actually build both of those things. And that will be my plan for the next video is we're going to replace this welder, which really hasn't worked out as well as I'd hoped. But because of its size, because of its shape, and because I really like that it fits in with being chicken, I'm going to call it the Nugget. Because it is a little nugget of a ship. And at this point, I want to... Well, talk about what our options are if the vanilla welding ships don't work. If I can get something that works reasonably well, I intend to use a vanilla design in this playthrough. Because I do like to try and come up with vanilla solutions to the problems that I create for myself. And although I do try and stick to that pretty tightly, this situation with the welders not having any useful range is a bit frustrating. So... If the vanilla welder ship doesn't end up working properly or doesn't end up really being all that useful, I will almost certainly use the mod that will change the range of the small ship welders back to pretty much what it was before they patched it in 1.186. And I don't really want to use any of the laser welding mods or anything like that. I'd like to keep it so that it is a vanilla design and that hopefully when Keen fix the welder range, because I like to believe that this is broken, then we can just get rid of the mod and everything will work normally anyway, which would be ideal, I think. At least with the way that we're playing through this sort of survival scenario. One of the last things I wanted to show is actually what I did to the game in order to get the exact images that I took. I forgot when I was recording just before to point this out. If we go to edit settings and we go to mods, we can actually add an extra mod to the game to allow us to take perfectly clear shots. And that's the clear camera screen mod, which gives us a perfectly clear camera view when we look through it, rather than having those blue lines across it, which for me was preferable because I wanted the map image to be as clear as possible like if I took it with the spectator camera. This is how good it looks through the camera. And as you can see, if we look at the back here, I didn't really demonstrate this earlier. Rich 27 script works with some ridiculous angles and figures out pretty quickly which way is perfectly down. And that's why I wanted it. Just in case I was flying along and doing stuff and ended up at a slight angle and I hadn't realized. I mean, even if you're perfectly, if you think you're perfectly level, you may be further off than you expect. Like, I thought I was pretty level there, but actually I was tilted a fair bit nose up. 
So it's very handy from that point of view. But we were talking about the camera mod. Stop getting distracted, Splitzy. The camera mod looks like this, which is perfect. It's all nice and clear. That camera and small grid name that you can see in the top left, those can be easily cleared by deleting the name of your ship and deleting the name of the camera. So if we go to K and we go camera and simply delete it and go to info and delete that. Now, if I hop out of that view, take control of the ship again, I can go back to the camera and they're all gone and you've got a perfectly clear view. This is actually a trick I use when filming light echoes, our machinima series that I make. This allows me to do camera shots that would be next to impossible with the spectator camera while also having a perfectly clear point of view. That's why I'm familiar with this mod and why I thought I should highlight that I did use it for making the map. Now some of you might wonder whether it was the best idea to use a separate save to create the map and I do have mixed feelings on the fact that I did that. It may, may not have been my best of ideas but I figured all we'd really be using was a whole lot of time and not a little bit of battery power to get the photos in this session. The other reason I chose to do the map the way I did was so that I didn't have to shoot it over multiple days. I would have had to wait two hours if I missed the midday time, whereas if I loaded up a separate save, went to Alt F10 and went to Admin Tools, I was able to change the time of day offset so that I could get the shots exactly right for each area I was in. I was able to have the sun as directly overhead for each part as I could possibly get. And that was the main reason I did it that way. It saved me probably about eight or so hours of fiddling. And for me, that time was worth it. Plus, it meant I got to highlight that you can use this control here. And that's, you know, that's a good thing. Despite the frustration with the welders, I am still very happy with how things are going. In fact, I'm incredibly happy with how this map turned out. It takes a lot of work to put all of these images together in Photoshop so that they look like a map, but I reckon the end result is worth it. And it is very nice using Whiplash's uh, LCD image creator thingy. What's it called? Whiplash, Whip's Image Converter. It is very nice using that. Probably a little easier than SE image to LCD. And I am stoked with how this looks. I think it is a very nice addition to our little base. Next episode, we've got those two attempted vanilla welder solutions. So there's that and plenty more to come. So I'll see you then.